All right. Well, please open up your Bibles to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. We're making our way through the book of Jonah and seeing God as the great God of compassion. We're seeing his grace and his mercy. And this morning, we're going to finish up the last verse of chapter one through the end of chapter two. And in this chapter, we get to see what pretty much every child's story regarding the book of Jonah depicts. We get to see Jonah and the fish, Jonah and the whale. Countless puzzles have been crafted, showing all sorts of images, like Jonah flying out of the blowhole onto dry land. Other amazing depictions of people's imagination because it's not what exactly is described in this chapter as we'll see this morning. And it's easy to get caught up in what happens with the fish in this chapter. It's not a surprise that people would do this. It's easy to get so caught up in what's going on with the fish that we actually miss what's going on with Jonah. And and that we actually miss the God behind the fish. Because you see, this book is about God saving those most wouldn't think could be saved and using extraordinary means, supernatural means to do so. From foreign sailors to wayward prophets to a whole city, no one is out of the reach of God. And in chapter two, we see a glorious and an amazing picture of salvation. In chapter 2, we see a physical salvation, but one that pictures something far greater. And this isn't an allegory. This isn't a made-up story or a, a parable. It's an actual event. It's an actual story of something that actually took place. But while we watch what God does physically to save Jonah, we also see what God will do spiritually. And in Jonah 2, we see a physical salvation that demonstrates a spiritual point. God literally, figuratively, physically goes to the depths of the ocean to save his prophet. This book is about salvation through the compassion of God. And in this book, we see that among Gentiles, among non-Jews and the sailors and those in Nineveh. These are the people many Jews didn't think could be saved, and we see that in a prophet of the people of God who seems too far gone as he's fleeing from the presence of the Lord. But no one can escape from God. No one is too far gone. No one can escape God, and no one is so far from God that God can't save them from their sins. You may have even come here this morning knowing in your heart and knowing in your mind that you are far from God. But listen, friend, you don't need to remain that way. What we're going to see this morning is that salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is from the Lord. So if you have concluded in your heart, I'm too far gone, there's no hope for me. Listen closely this morning. Because you're going to see that salvation is from the Lord. And God loves to seek and save the lost. In this chapter, a fish swallows a prophet, yet that's not the most impressive thing here. A compassionate, gracious, loving God is far more impressive. Far more impressive. Now remember our setting here, Jonah was on a boat with pagan sailors seeking to flee the presence of the Lord, and the Lord hurls a great wind, and through a number of events, Jonah is identified as the reason that this calamity has come upon them in this boat, and he instructs them to throw him overboard, and the sailors, after trying everything else they could, they finally do so, and the storm calms, and Jonah is now in the ocean, and that's our setting for our passage this morning. And so let's read together, starting in verse 17 of chapter 1. And the Lord, and Yahweh, appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Verse 1 of chapter 2. 
Then Jonah prayed to Yahweh his God from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to Yahweh and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Yahweh my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered Yahweh, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving that which I have vowed, I will pray. Salvation is from Yahweh. Then Yahweh commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Let's pray together. God, what a beautiful picture of salvation, of of a physical rescue for Jonah. What a great display of your character and your kindness and your grace. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would Affect our hearts with your word. That once again, Lord, you would impress us with your grace. That you would give hope to us where we need it. That you would convict of sin. That you would enable greater holiness. That you would deepen love for you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, salvation is from the Lord. That's the whole point of what's going on here in chapter two. Salvation is from the Lord. And this reality that salvation is from the Lord is demonstrated in three ways in our passage. In our passage, we see in three ways that salvation is from the Lord and no one else. There are three demonstrations that put on display for us the reality that salvation is from the Lord. And let's look at those three together. First, the reality that salvation is from the Lord is demonstrated by, number one, God's appointment. Number one, God's appointment. Salvation is from the Lord, and we see that in verse 17, through God's appointment. Look with me again at verse 17. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Now, one thing as we jump further into this passage right up front that we need to get out in the open is that the book of Jonah is communicating actual events, historical events that took place. This isn't a parable. It's not an illustration. These are events that actually happened. And you might ask, well, how do we know that this isn't an illustration or how do we know this isn't a parable? A fish swallowing a man is pretty far-fetched, at least with him surviving after And that's a reasonable question with a simple answer. You see, the passage does not tell us that it's a parable or an illustration. The text only communicates this as an event that God has caused. God is the appointer in this passage. God caused it. God appointed a great fish. God is not like an appointer of a great fish. God actually appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. There's nothing in the book or the rest of Scripture that would cause us to think otherwise. In fact, Jesus himself, his attestation to Jonah's being in the belly of the fish, only confirms this as an actual event that took place. So yes, Jonah was in the belly of a sea creature for three days, and his life was preserved. And if there's some who are still skeptics, if you may be thinking, oh, that could never happen, I'm, I'm really struggling with how that would work scientifically, how would there be oxygen, how would he be able to survive? Well, you see, that's, that's the point. 
That's the point of chapter 2. It was a supernatural act of God to appoint this fish to swallow Jonah. And it was a supernatural act of God to preserve him in the belly for three days and three nights. Do not settle for a natural explanation of this event. This was and can only be explained as a miracle of salvation that the Lord brought about. He appointed this fish. He brought this fish to to Jonah in his time of need. A large sea creature coming at just the right moment, swallowing a prophet at just the right time, and that prophet living in the belly for three days and three nights can only be explained as a divine act of salvation. That's the whole point here. God brought about this salvation for Jonah. He appointed it. And Jonah sees that in verse 9, and we need to see that here as we consider God's appointment of this fish. That's the whole point, that God brought about this salvation. God is the creator of all things. He created the world using supernatural means. He sustains the world and all of his creation is upheld. It's all upheld in his power for him. So for God to use supernatural means to rescue someone is par for the course for God. That's what he does. And if you struggle with Jonah's life being preserved for three days in a fish, then you're really going to struggle when a Jewish rabbi is nailed to a cross, crucified, dies, is buried, raises from the dead, and ascends into heaven. And if you struggle with that reality, then you have bigger problems than reconciling a man being swallowed by a fish. God God is in the business of rescuing people, of saving people. That's what he does. That's what he does. He does that here physically for Jonah, and he does that spiritually using the supernatural means of the work of his son, fully God, fully man, living the perfect life, dying on a cross, and conquering death for all who would believe in him. The reality that salvation is from the Lord is demonstrated here by God's appointment. Being swallowed by the fish here wasn't the trial for Jonah. It was actually God's means of salvation for Jonah. It was the rescue. And God is always working every event for his glory. He's working every event for his glory, and he is working every event for his will, for his people, and God will even appoint a great fish if that's what it takes. People are captivated by this miracle, and they should be, but that's not even the most impressive thing that's taking place here, that a fish would swallow a man. Far more impressive than a fish swallowing a man is the God who appointed that fish in his grace and in his compassion and in his mercy and in his loving discipline for his child, for his prophet. Now, appointed here, we must see this about this word. Every time this word is used in Jonah, it points to God's power to accomplish his will. Turn ahead to chapter 4 just for a moment. Chapter 4, verse 6. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah. Look at verse 7. The Lord appointed a worm. Verse 8, God appointed a scorching east wind. You can go back to chapter 2. God is doing all of these things to bring about his will. He's commanding plants and worms and winds and fish to accomplish his purposes. And we see everyone and we see everything in this book obeying God except for the prophet of the Lord. What a backward picture for Jonah. Even a worm obeys the Lord better than Jonah. Even a plant without a brain obeys God. Even a fish obeys God as God in his sovereignty and goodness brings about salvation through this divine appointment. This is truly astonishing that God would bear with his prophet in this way. 
we need to have a bigger understanding of God and his sovereignty and his providence. That he is working all things together at once for his good pleasure, for his people's good. And that's not an admonishment to us as a church. It's an encouragement to excel, excel still more because I can't tell you how encouraged I have been over the last several months and years being in this church Hearing many of you respond to various trials and hardships and deaths and sickness and loss of jobs and hard family situations, you know and you love the sovereignty of God. You know and you love the providence of God. You love the character of God. But even at our best, we still have so much to grow because he is so captivating. He is so amazing. Even at our best, we still have so much to grow in our understanding and practice in light of this reality of God. Because every complaint Every moment of discontentment, every moment of anger or disobedience to God, every moment of fear, every moment of anxiety is rooted out of a lack of right thinking about the goodness and the sovereignty of God. God is always appointing and directing and arranging and working in every event, in every circumstance. He is doing all things to accomplish his good pleasure. And if you're a believer, it is for your good as well. And everything is at his disposal. He's even willing to call upon a fish if that's what is necessary. Jonah is swallowed by this fish and is in the stomach and lots of debate about what actually swallowed Jonah has taken place. The word in the Hebrew is dog and simply means fish or sea creature. God did not see the need to tell us the specifics of what exact species it was that actually swallowed Jonah. We could make educated guesses, but we can't let ourselves get distracted trying to figure out just how this could happen. We need to, in faith, in faith, believe God's word, knowing he is God, and could do all and does all that he pleases. So God appointed a great sea creature to save his prophet. Jonah is suicidal in the ship. Jonah wanted to die and be done with his problems and done with God, yet God is not done with him. God is a saving God. He saves out of compassion and mercy, not out of merit from the individual. Jonah did nothing to merit this kind of kindness from the Lord, this kind of rescue from God. And God here is not wanting to just punish Jonah to teach him a lesson. He wants to save Jonah, and that means saving Jonah from himself. He's not a, a tyrant or a harsh, unloving dictator. He's not a despot. If he was a tyrant, then the book of Jonah would end at verse 16, where Jonah gets what he deserves. But that's not God. He rescues the weak. He rescues the disobedient, the defiant, the rebellious. And we, here we see him command his creation to do so. If you've ever thought you don't know what I've done. You, you don't know the kind of life I've lived. There are things that I've done that, that no one knows of. That, that, I, I'm too far gone. I'm too lost. I'm too sinful. I'm too bad. There's no way back for me. There's no redemption for me. There's no turning back. If, if that's you, I am so glad that you are here this morning. 
I am so glad that you are here this morning because you need to understand that if you are still alive, there is still hope for you. Jonah's at the bottom of the sea, at the end of his rope. He thinks it's all over. And God brings, supernaturally, a fish to swallow him to save him. This is what God does. He saves and his salvation is not based upon anything but his character, his compassion, his grace, and his work, which is fully capable fully capable of saving anyone. There is hope for you. Salvation is from the Lord. That is first demonstrated through God's appointment. That was number one. Next, we see the reality that salvation is from the Lord, and we see that demonstrated by Jonah's prayer. So first, we saw that salvation is from the Lord, put forth in God's appointment, and now we see Jonah attest to the reality that salvation is from the Lord also, Jonah's prayer. And these verses are really the psalm of Jonah. Jonah understands that salvation is from the Lord, and he responds to God bringing salvation through a fish in prayer. Jonah, running from the Lord on a boat with pagan sailors, And in a supernatural storm, the lot falls on him. He's thrown overboard, drowning in the sea. Seaweed is wrapped around his neck. He's on the verge of death. And all of a sudden, he's swallowed by a fish. What do you do now? He prays. Now is a good time to pray. Finally, something to emulate in Jonah. So if you're ever running from the Lord and you find yourself cast into the sea because of a huge storm and a fish comes and swallow you, swallows you, that would be a good time to pray, to thank God, to praise God. And that's what Jonah does here. When things were at their worst for Jonah, Jonah called upon the Lord. When things were at their worst for Jonah, Jonah was at his best. There's a sobering reality as we so quickly try to run from trials and hardships, and yet God repetitively uses those kinds of things to cultivate what is pleasing to him in us. That's how he works oftentimes in the lives of his people. It's hard, you are in distress, and God uses that to humble us and to bring us into submission to him. And see, the distress of Jonah's rebellion And disobedience to God, that was far worse than his distress of drowning in the sea. Sure, Jonah's drowning in the sea, and he thinks his life is over, but the far greater distress in Jonah's life is that he was walking, he was running from the presence of the Lord in disobedience. It's far better to drown in a sea than to drown in disobedience. Yet here, Jonah does neither because of God. Now, Jonah's prayer can be broken down into three sections, and that's what we're going to do this morning. So as we examine Jonah's prayer, we get the, the second half of the outline, the one through three and the one through three. So this is number one, Jonah's distress is heard. So under Jonah's prayer, where we see that salvation is from the Lord, we're going to break that prayer down into three parts. And the first part is Jonah's distress is heard. Jonah offers a prayer to the Lord, and he communicates his distress. He shares what is going on, and the Lord hears him. Verse 1 of chapter 2, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. And this shows that Jonah is not dead in the fish. He is praying to God from the belly of the fish, and he says, I called out of my distress to the Lord. And he answered me. I cried for help help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. Jonah's distress is answered. He is heard by God. As Jonah describes him in chapter 1, the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land, that God, he heard Jonah. He answered Jonah. Jonah. 
This rebellious prophet who is walking in disobedience and fleeing from God is heard and answered by God. This is a God who loves to save people. He doesn't discipline his children for condemnation. He disciplines them for restoration. Christian, are you in distress? Are there circumstances or sin that you are drowning in? Do you need wisdom? Do you need someone to answer you in your distress? Maybe there's a sin that you keep coming back to and it's weighing on you and you want to rid yourself of that sin but you feel hopeless in your sin. You're at a loss. I I can't do it. I try and I try and I keep coming back. Seek Seek the Lord in his word and prayer. Cry out to him. But but you don't know what it's like. You don't know how deep I am in sin. And this happened to me. And this happened to me. And this is going on inside of me. You don't know how deep in this sin I am rooted You can't get any deeper than Jonah is in the ocean here. Jonah has been running from God. God hears him. God answers him in his distress. God will hear your call of distress. He will answer you. That's the kind of God that he is. Jonah says, I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. Sheol is a general term, meaning the place of the dead. And Jonah here is saying, I was on the brink of death. I was staring death in the face. My life was flashing before my eyes. I was at the end of my rope. And you heard me. If you are alive, you are not too far gone to be heard by God. To be answered in your distress. Jonah's distress is heard. And next we see that Jonah's distress is described. That's the second element of Jonah's prayer that we see here that demonstrates that salvation is from the Lord. See, God is a saving God and he hears the cries of his people. He sees their distress, he knows their distress, and he desires to bring about restoration from their distress. And here Jonah, he has shared that God has heard his distress, and now he's going to describe the distress that he was in. He's going to describe what was going on. We see it starting in verse 3, for you had cast me into the deep, Into the heart of the seas and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars were round me forever. Here he's in the ocean. Waves are crashing around him. Seaweed is wrapped around his neck. He's at the bottom. But I want you to see something. Look again at verse 3. He says something interesting. Jonah says, you had cast me into the deep. I thought the sailors did it. What is he saying here? Well, though this came at the hands of the sailors, Jonah realizes it is the right judgment of God on his life. God throws him overboard here through the hands of others. And Jonah affirms, this was the right judgment on me. Jonah sees this as the right consequence of his own actions. In this statement, he's not condemning God for being cast into the sea. He is acknowledging his own actions have brought him to this place as he removed himself from a place of submission under God. Verse 4, I have been expelled from your sight. 
Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. And Jonah uses an interesting choice of words. He uses it again in verse 7. We don't know all of Jonah's motives here, but where he once was running from God's presence, he's now talking about looking at his temple. This is Jonah wanting to be near the presence of God again. He he originally wanted to flee from the presence of the Lord, and now he is anticipating looking again toward the temple, which is Jonah expressing he no longer wants to flee the presence of the Lord, but rather wants to be near his presence. He says, water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around his head. He's sinking. The earth with its bars is around me forever. Jonah thinks he's dying here. He thinks he's dying. He's at the bottom of the sea, and it seems to him that this is the end. There's no way forward for Jonah. He understands and sees that it was right for him to be in this state He's getting his just desserts. And it is good to remember in our distresses to remember what God pulls us out of. To remember what God has done to rescue us. To remember what he saved us from. Jonah here is praying and he's recounting how he was so close to death. And yet God pulled him out of that. Jonah here is praying and remembering the sheer helplessness that he was in and the fact that he was at his end. But God, in verse 6, but God. The end of verse 6, we'll look at closer in a moment. But Jonah is at the bottom of the sea. Death is imminent. But you, God, brought me up from the pit. What a great picture of God's saving grace to rescue his own. God rescues. God saves. And this is what he did from the very beginning of our salvation. In Jonah, he's being saved from a physical death, but Paul communicates this for Christians in Ephesians 2. It has the same feel as Jonah's statement here, but in a spiritual sense, right? Ephesians 2, 1 through 7. Christian, what was your greatest distress? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, but deliverance. But salvation, but forgiveness, but redemption. And it says, but God, but God, that's who we were, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That's what God does. That's what he loves to do, to save sinners, to rescue sinners. To rescue those who think there's no way forward. There's nothing left for me. I'm too far gone, too helpless, too hopeless, too lost. But God. But God. This is the kind of God we serve. A God who rescues people from the depths of the ocean. A God who rescues sinners from their spiritual death and brings them to life. A God who rescues his own children. He he rescues his own children children from their foolish straying and rebellion. From beginning to the end, if salvation comes, it only comes from the Lord. Jonah's distress is heard. Jonah's distress is described. And lastly, the last section of Jonah's prayer where we see that salvation is from the Lord 
is Jonah's distress is delivered. Jonah's distress is delivered. We see that in verses six through nine, the second half of verse six through nine. Jonah calls out to God in his distress. God hears him, answers him, and delivers him. The second half of verse six, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Verse seven, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. As I mentioned a moment ago, a change is happening in Jonah. And though he has been running from the presence of God, now he is thinking on God's holy temple. And this demonstrates the change in his disposition. He was running from the Lord's presence, and now he's remembering the Lord and praying to the Lord where his presence dwells. He's coming before the Lord in prayer. Jonah was running from God. He wanted to be as far away from God and from the presence of God as possible, and now he remembers him in his temple. His salvation could only come from the Lord, and his salvation has come from the Lord, and Jonah is recognizing how dramatically distinct Yahweh is in this. He notes this in verse 8, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Jonah recognizes the emptiness of idols and their inability to help. Where Yahweh is being faithful, vain idols are not. And there is no faithfulness in false gods. They are useless in times of distress. God hears him in his distress, answers him in his distress. Idols, they will not. False gods, faithless. They are useless in times of distress. And this is the right view of idols. And this is sobering considering how quickly we can run to vain idols in our distresses. Thinking that they have power to bring relief. But they only forsake their faithfulness. Idols promise a lot and they deliver on nothing. Jonah sees a stark contrast between false gods and his God. He knows where his deliverance has come from. And it was a gracious, merciful, and compassionate, and loving God. Jonah sees this. He goes on to say, but I will sacrifice to you while false gods, while idols are of no help and are of no good. You have saved me and I will worship you. I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay, salvation is from the Lord. Jonah is committing himself to service of God and worship. He says that I will sacrifice with thanksgiving in verse nine. And that which he has committed to the Lord in a vow he will follow through on. And his conclusion in all of this, at the end of his prayer, having been in the belly of the fish, being in the belly of the fish, rescued by God, is that salvation is from the Lord. Salvation from his rebellion is from the Lord, and salvation from his imminent death is from the Lord. Jonah is in great distress, and he calls upon the Lord. The Lord hears and answers and delivers. His distress is relieved. Have you been ever distressed? Are you in distress right now? Stressed out? Maybe things even this last week have come from your mouth like, so stressed right now. You don't understand the stress I'm under at work. I'm in a stressful home environment. I'm sure there are many other things as well to be distressed over. God has grace for you in those things. God will listen to you in your prayers. He will hear you. But listen, there is a, there is a distress that even believers face at times, and it's far greater than those kinds of things. 
And that doesn't minimize the reality of challenging situations, but it, it highlights the reality of this other distress, this greater distress. See, the greatest stresses that come into your life, the greatest distress that you find yourself is not work, it's not family, it's not having too much to do and too little time to do it. It's not a busy schedule. It's not tight finances. It's not poor health reports. The greatest stress that comes into your life, that comes into my life, is sin. It's rebellion against God. It's rebellion and disobedience to God. And there is a crushing weight of spiritual agony at the potential of eternal separation unless God intervenes. And in Christ Jesus, God hears us even from the depths of Sheol. He hears us. He hears the unbeliever who has been granted faith and calls out to him in faith and repentance. And he hears his wayward child who has been caught up in sin's deceitfulness and is being rescued out of that sin. When all hope is lost, Jonah thinks he's dead and salvation comes from the Lord. And for the non-believer, when all hope is lost, if, if you but turn to Jesus in faith and repentance, you will find that there is salvation for you in the Lord and for the believer who is struggling and falling back into sin and running from the blood-bought fellowship you should be having with God. There is salvation from your sin in God. In our hardest trials and our most painful sufferings. There is salvation in God. In our hardest trials and in our most painful sufferings, the only permanent relief comes from the burden of sin being lifted through Jesus Christ who relieves our stresses and saves us in our distress. You know, Jesus' words in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Every other stress, every other trial, every other hardship is lessened when our greatest distress of sin has been dealt with and forgiven by Jesus. Salvation is from the Lord. We see that in Jonah's prayer. And then lastly, the reality that salvation is from the Lord is demonstrated by God's commandment. Number three, God's commandment. We see that in verse 10. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Everything I said about God's appointment could be restated right here in God's commandment. Jonah has been in the belly of the fish, traveling back to the dry land. His journey in the fish is over, and the Lord, Yahweh, commands the fish, which was God's instrument of salvation for Jonah, and it obediently spews him up onto dry land. The reality That God saves is the most beautiful and precious reality one could ever know. The process of how he brings about salvation isn't always pretty. In Jonah's case, it was being vomited onto dry land by a fish. But God does it from the beginning and in. The fish's mission is accomplished. And again, we see a graphic expression of the reality that salvation is from the Lord and that he will command his creation to bring it about if necessary. This should just grip our hearts. This should just grip our hearts. And we allow ourselves to be too easily distracted and too quickly impressed 
This is amazing what God does to care for his prophet here. If the compassion of God and the power of God working flawlessly together to rescue Jonah here doesn't just floor you, you've got some soul searching to do. You need to instruct your heart to be rightly impressed by what God is doing here. If this doesn't capture your attention, what have you trained your heart to be impressed by? We need to train our hearts to be rightly impressed by God because he is indeed truly amazing. God commands a storm. God directs a lot. God appoints a fish. God commands this fish. And this chapter is in your Bible to show you, to show us that only God can save. There is no other hope for Jonah. There is no other hope for the Ninevites, for the sailors we saw last time. And if God can save one of his prophets like this, is it too hard for him to save the hearts of the idolatrous Ninevites? Absolutely not. God can save from the most perilous physical distress, which is an awesome which is awesome, but this is also a picture of the reality that God can save from the most perilous spiritual distress. And either God does it or no one does it. Salvation is from the Lord. Salvation is only from the Lord. Other gods are but vain idols, and you can't save yourself. Only God. And if God can save a pagan sailors, if God can restore a rebellious prophet and save a whole city full of pagans, he can save your neighbor. He can save your coworker. He can save your relative. He can save your spouse. He can save your child. He can save anyone. He can save you. For salvation is from the Lord and only in the Lord. Let's pray. God, we just want to thank you for your word where we can set our gaze and spend minutes and hours and weeks and months and years and never exhaust the richness of who you are because you are so great and you are so holy and you are so captivating and you are so awesome. You are so merciful and so full of compassion, God. You are a God who saves and you have made salvation for eternity available in your son Jesus for those who but repent of their sins and turn to you in faith. Lord, I pray that this morning as we consider your word in Jonah chapter two, I pray that we would be filled with hope I pray that where there has been sin that we, we're just conflicted in, we act like we love it, but we feel like we hate it, and then we feel like we love it. Lord, I pray that you would help us to repent, help, that you would bring about salvation from those sins, that you would restore us into right fellowship with you. And for those who don't know you, God, I pray that, I pray that this morning would be would be a hope to them, a comfort to them, humbling for them. I pray that they would forsake themselves and that they would cling to you and look to you. There is no other Savior than you. Help us to love that reality more every single day. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.